Good to see you. Hey, it's good to be springtime already. That's awesome. If it'll just stay. I don't know who's praying for the cold weather around here, but would you please stop? Anyway, we're close, but uh, good to see you today. Uh, we're, we're coming into a really fun season of the year right now, and we're excited. The Friday night deal is so fun, and uh, you want to come. And this is one of the places you can meet people, make friends, and uh, just enjoy a really good evening. There'll be a lot of original music going on and, and things like that. So if you can make it, do. Uh, last week, I shared a bit of my story with you, not because I just like to tell stories, but uh, I really have a passion for this um, this aspect of walking with Jesus, and that is to hear his voice. You know, it's so important that we have personal relationship with the Lord, and people that are in relationship talk to each other. And we live in times today where if you would say to somebody, hey, I heard the Lord say something to me, or uh, this is what the Lord said, or I feel this is from the Lord, people look at you like, okay, uh, you know, are you all right? And for me, I'm just saying that if he's not talking to you, I want to ask you, are you all right? Because the Bible tells us that his sheep hear his voice. And I'm so glad that the Lord used a, uh, an illustration that, you know, sheep are not really smart. Can I just tell you that? If one goes over the cliff, usually the rest of them will follow. And they're, they're, not, they're not really a really bright animal, uh, by and large. And so when the Lord calls us his sheep, I think it's kind of important to know that he's not maybe expecting us to be able to be self-sufficient, totally. And so he wants to get on board with us and direct us and lead us and so forth and so on. And the shepherd sheep uh, uh, analogy in the scriptures is quite strong. There's many, many of these kind of things. David was called the shepherd of Israel. Even though he was a man after God's own heart, he was depicting what it's like to walk with, with man. And so what I want to do today is maybe put a little meat on the bones uh, of what I talked about last week because I told you stories last week. I want to give you some scriptural um, backbone to think that you can walk this out yourself. And chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians is really one of the texts that I have loved over the years. I, 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 there's so many scriptures that I love, but this chapter right here, uh, basically the best way I can uh, illustrate this for this morning's purposes, I think, is by the title, Breaking Through the Clouds. Um, how, how many of you have traveled recently by air? Let me see your hands just out of curiosity. You could be fresh in your mind. Just, just a few of us. Uh, but I'm, I'm presuming that probably most of us have at some point in time, and you might take this illustration and make it a little bit personal. Um, when you are living in a place like we've been living the last few days where it's cloudy and rainy and nasty, um, and you get on a plane, it only takes a few minutes for you to break through the clouds, and above the clouds is bright, sunny, with unlimited visibility. And down below the clouds, it looks entirely different. Or even if it's a, it's a clear day, when you, when you get in that plane and you, you achieve altitude, you look down on your surroundings where you've been so used to living and, and your paradigm is involved in a very small part of that uh, countryside, you get up above it and you get perspective. And that, is, in a very, very real way, talks about the realm of the kingdom of God to me. See, there is a lot of invisible activity going on. I may shock some of you this morning by saying this, but I absolutely believe it. I don't doubt it for one second that in this room this morning there are angels. Over the years, there's been some amazing stories that have come out of people in this room. Not that this room is anything out of the ordinary. I mean, uh, the Bible says many of us have entertained angels unawares. Why are we, why are we unaware? Because we can't see them. Sometimes we get to see them. But there have been many, many cases in this, in this church's history where people in this church have seen angels, different people, different age groups, not talking to one another, and they would describe the same activity by the same kind of an angel, with the same kind of a look and the same kind of actions going on. And so that's just one of those moments where people are able to see into the spirit realm. 
And please understand that the spirit realm actually supersedes the natural realm. We call it natural because we're here. But believe me, there's coming a day, one day, when we step into this other realm fully. And we're going to be saying, I wish I'd known that. I wish I'd been aware. I wish I had been accessing what God was doing, what God was saying. I wish I'd been tuned in to the realm of the Spirit because God is always speaking. God is always active. There are things going on all the time. And we have God's voice in one form here that we, we sometimes don't take seriously. But the Bible says this is the most sure word of prophecy. This is the logos of God. But in addition to that, there's another word for the word of God, which is called rhema. In the Greek, it means an actualized word or a word that's current, a word that's empowered at the moment. Now, when the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, it is not logos, it is rhema. So God is speaking actively in those moments, and when we hear it, faith rises. Now, many times, and this is a pattern, the faithfulness that we show to studying God's Word is going to pay off because at any moment, God can bring the Spirit upon a verse of Scripture and make it lift for you. How many of you have been reading along sometimes and all of a sudden, oh, I never saw that before. Well, that is because the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to it in that moment. Jesus promised that's what he was going to send the Holy Spirit to do. And so when we, that logos there that's written in a, in a, in a form on a page becomes rhema to us when God speaks. And so what I'm trying to get across to us is there is no difference, there is no Separation would be a better word. No separation between the value of this word and those extraneous things that God says to us personally. They flow together. And the knowledge of this one that's written will keep you in safe places because you will recognize the kind of thing that God has already said. The same author that gave these to the prophets now speaks to us as his people. When Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, he meant it. So my job and my passion is to open our eyes and our hearts to what God is saying now. It's important to know what God has said, but it's extremely important to know also what he is saying. You're looking at me like calves before a new gate. Now, come on now. This is important. In my life, it has been life-changing. God speaks. In fact, the very desire that you have to know him when you didn't know him, when somebody introduced the gospel to you and that desire that came in you, that was called conviction. You were afraid not to hear it. You were afraid not to respond to it, but there was something compelling about it. That is the voice of God. Because you can't come to God unless the Spirit of God draws you. So you think, well, I don't want to hear from God. Are you saved? If you're saved, you heard from God. And now that you are saved, the Spirit of God dwelling inside of you is a receptor. He can recognize the voice of Jesus, the voice of the Father. And believe me, He is talking. Any relationship without communication is in a deficit. So, when we look at this, I, I want you to see this with me. I want you to understand what I'm talking about. Um, Let's jump right into the scriptures today. Um, the genesis of this struggle to gain altitude in our thinking comes from what I call earth-centric mindset. The natural mind, as incredible as it is, has suffered significant debilitation from its original design as indicated in Romans 8-7. In this instance, we're informed that the carnal or fleshly mind is literally at war with God that it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So that the original equipment that you came with has been debilitated by something called sin. Sin contorts us. It twists us and makes us driven by our own will. Now, God gave us all a free will, 
But his intention was that we would, with that free will, follow him. In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. One was the tree of life. You eat of that and you live forever. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You eat of that one and you die. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents, and all the Hebrew scholars would say the same, it represents the, the, the decision to decide for oneself what is right and what is wrong. We call it relativism in our time. Your truth may be different than my truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You say, well, we're all going the same place. Well, not so fast. We are not. If any man seeks to come up another way, Jesus said, he's a thief and he's a robber. There's one way. I know that sounds unfair, It sounds exclusive, but think of the wisdom of it. If there were a hundred ways, how would you know yours was one of them? Jesus was, he's the only one that ever got resurrected. Everybody else is, you know, in their grave in one form or another. So it's important for us to understand that, that the exclusivity of the message of Christ and of Christendom is unique amongst all religions. And it's a good thing because if there were all these options, it would be so confusing and you'd never know. So don't fall fall prey to that. Don't fall prey to the relativism that comes so naturally to you. Realize that the natural mind is at war with God. Sin has clearly taken a toll on our perceptions and placed us at odds with God's kingdom. Thankfully, there's a remedy. Just a few chapters further on in the book of Romans, we're given a lifeline to begin to restore us to our original potential depicted in Adam and Eve. It says this, Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This scripture here offers us a tremendous option. Conformed literally means to accommodate oneself to a model or a pattern, in this case, of worldly wisdom. Another uh, descriptive of it is to be pressed into the mold of. There's pressure to be like what you see. And so this, we all know this. It starts early on in peer pressure, and, and the culture has a peer pressure to us. And we need to be like this one, and Hollywood comes out with this kind of a mindset, and everybody feels like that's the way I should be too. Uh, you know, and it, just, it just gets to be ridiculous after a while, and authenticity is lost, and we all become some kind of clones of something. But God says, I want you to be transformed Conformed is one thing. Transformed is something entirely different. On this, uh, this particular word is identical to the word we read about in the Scriptures where Jesus was transfigured. He went up the mountain, looked like everybody else. But when he got to the mountain, the, the Father's presence came upon that whole situation. His clothing got to be so white and bright you couldn't hardly look at it. And the Father confirmed his identity right there. It was obvious that heaven and earth met in those moments. And what I want you to see is that God wants to take your decrepit, broken down soul, spirit, and body, and he wants to transform it. He wants to transfigure you into somebody that can traffic in the the kingdom of God as well as the kingdom of this age. God has no alternate plan to reach mankind. You're it. God wants to make you like the mountain of transfiguration. He wants you to be a place and me to be a place where the kingdom of God intersects with the kingdoms of this age. Now think about that. You just think you kind of got accepted and you accepted Jesus and you're going to heaven and you're kind of just hanging out, hoping things go good and praying a little bit. and You know, we all do that. But that's because the devil does not want you to know who you are. He wants you to feel like a soldier without a platoon leader. He wants you to feel like you're just out there trying to get by. And God says, hey, I've made you, I've transformed you. I've seated you with me in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You have access. You have authority. 
You have a destiny. You have value. You have a spiritual ear. You have spiritual eyes. You can see the things that I'm... He, he talked to the disciples about the, about the parables. And they said, why, yeah, why do you speak in parables? He said, because hearing, they won't hear. But hearing, you will hear. You're plugged in. You have the ability. You have access. And what I say to them, they, they, they process it mentally and emotionally. With you, you have a spiritual processor. You can hear my voice. You can know me. You can follow me. You can experience me because I am real, I am living, and I have a mouth. I love this. I just love it. And let me just say that God doesn't want to make you miserable. I remember when I first became, became spirit-filled, I was in a kind of an environment uh, in some real legalistic churches. And if you listen to the messages and stuff, you, you deduce that God wanted you to be pretty miserable. You, you were going to have to do stuff you don't want to do. You're probably going to have to marry somebody really homely, <laughs> but spiritual, and somehow spiritual and homely went together. I don't know how that was. I don't know why that was the presumption, but, but what a deal that is. Some of you went to the same church I went to, I think, didn't you? But the bottom line is God does not want to make you miserable. When, you, when Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, do you think you're going to have no running water and an outhouse in heaven, I mean, is that what you're thinking? But he is now already wanting to bring you into his fellowship. Now, am I saying everybody's going to be a millionaire? No. But I'm telling you what, you do not have to have a lot of this world's goods to be extremely happy. You can be fulfilled. And I have found it to be the case that when you know you're walking in the place God wants you to be, doing what God wants you to do, you are fulfilled whether you have a bunch or whether you have not too much. And I'm, it's an amazing thing, and it's a testimony. And so I, I'm here today basically to try and encourage you that this is, is something you want to get your mind around, you want to get your heart attuned to it. And I want you to also know that God wants to, to bless you. I'm going to tell you a little quick story. And um, people like stories because it's a modern day scriptural experience. I'll let you know God's still doing things. When I was a boy, I, I used to come home from church on Sunday afternoon and there was a show called The American Sportsman. It was really cool. And all these guys were hunting and fishing all over the world, and it was just, like, really, really good. And I'd come home and sit and watch that thing. And one day I, I saw for the first time guys hunting in Africa. And I thought, wow, that is awesome. But I know I'll never get to do anything like that. That's just, that's just too much to even imagine. That's just got to be crazy expensive, and it's just, it would never happen to me. And I watched that for years and I always kind of harbored that desire and, and heart and so forth, but really, really never considered that's, that's in, my, in my wheelhouse. But one time, just a few years ago now, I was in Uganda with a couple of other people doing a pastor's conference there for about five or 600 pastors in Kampala. And we went from there over to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, to do another pastor's conference. We had about 400 pastors or so there in the capital. And it was over. We were done. We are tired. I was going to swing on up to uh, Israel and visit um, Ron and Carol Cantrell on my way home. And uh, we're sitting in the lobby of the Sheraton there in, in Addis, and, and uh, we're getting ready to go to the airport about 1 a.m. And uh, somebody mentioned... Tom Duchel in, in Zimbabwe. I didn't know these people. I didn't have any idea where Zimbabwe was at the time. And, but when they said that, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, you're going there tonight. Well, I, my first thought was, that is going to cost a fortune. And so I, I said to the people, you know, the Lord just spoke to me. I'm going to go there tonight. Now, I would never have made that 
that assumption and, 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 and zeroed in on that if I hadn't had a few rodeos with the Lord already. Are you, are you there? But he'd been so faithful and so true and so good and so beyond my imaginings and all the things he'd spoken to me in the past that I said, I'm going. I called my travel agent with fear and trembling and told her what I was going to do. And she said, oh, that's going to be expensive. <laughs> I know. I'm a man under orders. <laughs> and so um, she, she called me back in about 15 minutes or so. And she says, I can't believe it. You're going to get $600 back. How's that possible? Going to Zimbabwe was about a 12-hour trip from Addis. I said, well, there you go, confirmation. And so we went to the airport, got on a flight to Nairobi, spent an awful night in the Nairobi airport. If you ever go to Africa, don't go to Nairobi. That airport is terrible. Unless they've redone it. Anyway, it was like 3.30 in the afternoon before we could make the trip from Nairobi to Lusaka, Zambia, and then on over to Harare, Zimbabwe. And um, I didn't know what to expect, but when I got there, met Pastor Tom, sitting in his backyard that night, I felt like I'd come home. It was the most crazy feeling. Because when you travel internationally, you very seldom feel home. There's nothing about it that was normal. But my heart was at peace. It was at rest, and it was, it was a God thing. And favor was there. Pastor Tom had never met me in my life. He'd never heard of me. He had no idea except what he felt with his heart. And he put us in front of his businessman, Victory Forum there, um, significant guys and lots of them, uh, the next day in a business conference and had to speak to him. And on Sunday put me in the pulpit in a 7,000-seat church. And you just don't do that. But God established a relationship with us. And all that we've done since then, all that we've done, the cholera epidemic, the medical shipments, the food shipments, the fellowship that we've had between our families and our congregations, that even to this day is still growing, was all in a you're going there tonight. You get what I'm saying? I heard a little, but I didn't hear the lot. And God is like that. You get a little, and if you obey the little, you get more. And it's still unfolding. I'm 17 trips in now. And here's what happened after church that day. This is what I love about the Lord. It's so cool. I had never said anything to anybody about the hunting that I dreamed. I'm sitting in the green room having a cup of tea after church. And this big mountain of a man, a white Zimbabwean guy, comes up to me and says, I hear you like to hunt. I said, yeah, I've done that all my life. I love it. It's just awesome. And he said, you're coming to my house. And he found out that I had one more day left, and the rest of the team had to go on. And he said, you're coming to my house. I said, you don't argue with that guy. I'm coming to your house. He says, we hunt tomorrow. And uh, I know some of you are getting squeamish now. I'm a member of PETA. <laughs> People eating tasty animals. So don't worry. So we get up at 3 a.m., we drive for five hours, and we hunt all day. Don't see hardly anything until 5 o'clock that night or so. <laughs> the Lord's calling. He does that sometimes. Yeah. And about 5.30 that evening, 5 to 5.30, uh, somehow the tracker saw Saw a stallion zebra off in the distance through brush. I can't even imagine I saw it. And you know what? I, I killed my first African animal. I know that freaks some of you out. But God gave us dominion over them. You know what I'm saying? I, I took dominion with a 338 wind mag, so there it was. <laughs> That's what happened. But the, the story is really this. I was sitting behind that zebra. Carl was taking a picture of me, and I, I just re I remembered 
as a kid. I can't even say I prayed it. All I know is it was a big desire. And the Lord gives us the desires of our hearts sometimes if our heart's for him. Here's my point. Even, even starting this church, I did not want to plant this church. But God changes your heart. He gives you some heart desires, and he, tr- and he transplants some heart desires, and he replaces some heart desires. And if our chief desire is to please him, he loves to please us. That's the God I know. I've seen it so many times. I'm not afraid like I used to be to take him at his word. I'm not afraid to take the risks anymore because how can you even call it a risk when God's asking you to do it? But you got to know it was him, don't you? And after all these years and all these experiences I've had, that's just one of many, one of many. But it reminds me over and over again, how can I do less How can I possibly risk missing all that God has? And if I can do one thing for us today, this is what I want it to be. I want to get you rabidly excited about communing with the Lord and hearing his voice and doing whatever he says to you to do. Yes, there's confirmation. Yes, there's timing. There's all of these things, but that's all in God's wheelhouse. He can do it. He can make it happen for you. He can involve you in his heart. He can put you in strategic places. He can introduce you to strategic people. He can give you desires that the world needs to experience. He loves pouring himself through us. He absolutely loves doing that. And I, my, my stories are just the tip of the iceberg for what he wants to do. My, my belief this morning is this, that he is wanting to uncork your vessel. And he wants to pour so much stuff into it that it starts overflowing to people around you. That you can't contain it. You have no desire to contain it. It gets stale if you contain it. Let it flow. Let it keep happening. Let your relationship with him be as fresh as this morning's news. Because he has things to say. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. I don't want to live on this level. I don't want to have cloud cover tell me how high I can go. I want to get through the cloud and I want to get into the stratosphere where he is doing his thing unhindered. Because my natural mind down here beneath the cloud cloud cover will stop it nine times out of ten because I have a plan. So I'm a self-made man. I'm sorry. You suffer from faulty workmanship. You don't want to be self-made. You were so limited. You don't want to be self-made. You may have a good plan. Your, your daddy and your granddaddy and your, your teacher, your professor, your boss, they may have a plan for you, but their plan for you is, is limited. It's below the clouds. You do not have to live up to other people's expectations. You have a chance to live up to God's meditations. He's creative. He's good. It was his idea to make us in his image. It was his idea that to invite us to be having co-dominion and co-rulership with him in the garden, and we fouled it up because we wanted to eat of a tree that said you can decide for yourself what is right and what is wrong. You can be like God, the enemy said. Lots of people today are telling us to be like God. Decide for ourselves. Be authentic. I'm just telling you. Saying what God says, doing what he instructs, is the way that you can self-authenticate. He'll let people know who you are when he needs to. And my plan for me would have been pathetic compared to what God's let me do. And I'm just, just like you. But somehow or other, he sorted me out. Somehow or other, he sorted my my dreams and my emotions and my fears and all those things. I said, hey, let's do this. And he put something in my heart. And from that day to this, I've never, I've never seen it fail when God does something like that, that it turns out really fantastic. Not always easy, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. 
And I want to I want to freak you out if I need to, but I'm telling you, you need to get on board with this. Because life is short, eternity is long. And God wants to make it so that we enjoy this life and feel fulfilled in this life, that what we've done in obedience will precede us into heaven. And our rewards are based on those good works and those followership issues that we've chosen to submit to. What a blessing. Both places. So it's worth everything you can put into it. Um, As believers, we are commanded to undertake this reversal of the fallen state of our minds. The goal is to have our minds transformed. This would, in effect, enable us to resume communion with God in order to experience and fully represent the realities of the kingdom of God to and on this planet. Pastor Bill Johnson once said three things that I feel summarize the concept. Number one, the renewed mind lives from heaven toward earth. Instructed us to pray. Jesus instructed us to pray. Let your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. We make the mistake of reversing that and looking from earth toward heaven. And the problem that we have is we tend to anthropomorphize God, which is a tendency we have to attribute human attributes to divinity. God is wanting to back that process way off because his ways are higher than our ways. He's he's not a man that he should lie. He's, He's not us, but he's wanting to come into us. And he wants to bring heaven's norms to supplant earth's norms. Because earth's norms are broken. Sin has broken mankind. It has ruined the destiny that God had in mind for us. But God has been in the process of reclaiming and restoring and building his family back up. And so what he had for Adam and Eve to walk with him in co-rulership in the garden, he now has for you and me. When he says we're seated together in heavenly places with him, that's a place of co-rulership. That's a place of access. That's a place of knowing what the Lord has on his mind. He said, I don't call you servants now, just I call you friends. And as I said last week, that's friends of the king. That is the closest group of people that he has to him. Access 24-7. The voice, the sharing, the, the planning together, the working together, the being at oneness. That's what the friends of the king are. And so we have this ability And the enemy does not want you to hear this. He does not want you to experience this. He wants you to feel like you're some kind of a a drone in the kingdom. He wants you to feel like you're you're one of the the nameless, faceless masses of people that God just tolerates and is going to let you in someday because of his largesse. He didn't call you those kind of people. He didn't call you plebes. He called you friends. He didn't call you just slaves He called you his children. Well, you know, folks, the devil does not want us to have that experience. He wants it to be far removed. He wants it to be formal. He wants it to be rules-oriented. And God wants it to be a whole lot different than that. I want you to think about that. He called himself the Father. He may be a king, but he's a father. He's got the resources of the king, but the heart of the father. And we're it. We're kids. And he he authored the whole concept of fatherhood and, and parenthood. And I want you to see that today. I want you to know that he desires to come really close. He desires to get into your innermost thought patterns. He, get, he desires to use all your faculties, all the gifts that he's given you. He wants you to put all that into his hands and say, God, make the most out of this that you can make. What a privilege. Oh, my gosh. Such a deal. And yet we want to be us. You never know if you, sur- if you surrender to God, whew, he's going to send you to Africa and make eat monkey meat or something. He's going <laughs> to, 
You don't want to lose, you don't want to lose control. Renewed minds live from heaven toward earth. They already know the goodness, the power, the creativity, the massive beauty of that place, and they consider that first and bring that understanding to earth. That's what he's talking about. Secondly, the renewed mind looks from the invisible world toward the visible world. We were doing that around this altar a while ago. We were seeing people with cancer and people with uh, emotional breakdowns and, and financial issues and you name it, the whole, the whole spectrum of things that we experience here. But we, instead of getting into problem solving on this, on this sphere, we're referring people to the great physician. We're referring people to the best financial manager in the universe. The one that owns the cattle on a thousand hills, that guy. We're, we're, we're talking to the one that created all of this and knows how everything works. And he wants to share your secrets with us. But we need to be faithful with what we have to grease the skids for what's coming. That's just the way this works. So we have a book here that tells us certain things that we need to do. They're not just in the genre of rules that have to be kept to qualify. They're in the genre of suggestions for how the kingdom works and how we need to cooperate with the kingdom. Jesus did it. He said, I only say what I hear my father say, and I can. Did you catch that? can only do what I see my father doing. So it's incumbent upon us, if it was incumbent upon Jesus, to really, you know, to, to be in communion with him so that we know these things and so that we can see what he's doing and put our hand to the plow that's in front of us when he puts it there. And sometimes your obedience in in one area, it doesn't seem related to your desire in another area, but it, it's, it's money in the bank for you when you obey God and what he puts in front of you because he's also taking consideration. He says, you, you know, he knows what you have need of before you even ask. And we sometimes think, i got to tell God the whole story. And our prayer time is spent telling God all the stuff he needs to know. I'm talking to you. Yeah, that's you I'm talking to. It, basically, our prayer time ends up being complaining or list reciting instead of communion. You might try it. You might, you might try and change the tack you have because he is speaking and he wants you to be quiet sometimes after you've praised him, you've walked into his presence, you've thanked him, you've, you've given him uh, your, your daily bread needs and so forth. And that is probably a good thing just to just meditate in something. Meditate in the law of the Lord. Meditate in the scriptures and, and let him wash over you with his goodness. You'll be amazed. When you hear his voice, it has a... T a t a tenor to it that is, is unlike anything else. It's just, it, it's, it, he doesn't like talk for six hours. He'll usually say one short thing. And I just, oh, yeah, that's it. That's it. And you do that. And later on, there's another, oh, that's it. And you find yourself being led by the breadcrumbs of God's voice. And it's so exciting. And he doesn't lead you into a cul-de-sac, can I just say? He doesn't just talk to see if you're listening. When he talks, there is all of heaven's authority. He says, my word shall not return to me void or empty, but it shall accomplish the purpose whereunto I sent it. And all of heaven's resources are standing on tiptoe waiting for permission to bring it to pass. I love that. That's what his voice is all about. He's casting his intent. He's seeing if we'll catch it. He's seeing if we'll say amen to it. And he releases it. Number three, a renewed mind 
puts on display the will of God. A renewed mind puts on display the will of God. Wow. A renewed mind. When you begin to think what God is thinking, his will is the most precious thing that there is. Everything else kind of, kind of, is pushed away. It just kind of goes away. Like when you turn on a light in a building that hasn't been used for a while, roaches or bugs just scatter. When God's word comes, it brings light, and the power of God is incumbent with that, and the demonic stuff and the messes of life seem to be going away. The peace of God comes in the midst even of trial and difficulty sometimes because God's voice calms the waves, just the way it is. It's a sure, it's a sure voice. It, it, you do, it does not like a lot of the opinion voices that we get. This one, it just speaks something, and it's solid, and you know it. Um, also, somebody said, I don't know if this was Bill or who, but it said, a miracle is a tutor to show us what the other side looks like. You know, we look at a miracle as just fixing the situation that we have, and thank God for that. But the, the, the real kicker on this thing is it shows you what the other side, what the resource above the clouds, if you will, has to offer. That helps us to pray in faith. I mean, you know, when you've been through a few things like this, those, those, those stories, those histories, those, those moments where God said something and, and sure enough it came to pass or God said something and it warned you away from something or opened up something to you and you see the fruit of that. That's why the Bible is so strong, but, but the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Oh. <sighs> When you've got stories to tell, when you've got experiences with God that God showed up in such amazing ways, whatever the situation was, it's powerful. It's like a modern-day scripture. It's, it's something that happened uh, upon God's volition. And when you realize this happened to me, nobody can take it away from you. And you're so willing to give it out because it's so real, it's so authentic. You don't, have to, you don't have to massage it. You don't have to jack it up. You can just say, this is what happened to me. And if they take it, fine. If they don't take it, fine. But God gives veracity to the truth of our testimony. And it has power. And he backs it up with his blood. These are life-changing things that happen. You know? It, it's, it's, so, it's so exciting. And... There are many people in this room today that I could call on. They could stand right here like we had a week and a half ago, I think, with, uh, with Charities uh, Wednesday night. We heard testimonies in this room of, of things God had done. And, man, those stories, those stories just encourage our faith. And God wants you to have those things. The very important words of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 are best understood when we place them in their historical uh, context. Apostle Paul was writing from the perspective he'd gained from after his experience with the people of Athens. And that, that story is pretty amazing. He had gone to Athens when Athens was a place where literally people just lived to hear some new thing. And they would come down to the Areopagus there and they would listen to all this one and that one and the other one. They had the, all these gods there and people would talk about all these philosophies and so forth. And he found the, uh, the, the uh, idol that, that talked about the unknown God. And, he, and his brilliant, he was brilliant. The guy was brilliant. And he, he fashioned this talk for the Areopagus to talk to them about the unknown God and to, to appeal to them intellectually and so forth and in hope that he could reach them because he was burdened by, the, by their lives. And, and he got up there and he did this talk and it fell flat. Hardly any place that he'd ever been was as flat as that one in Athens. And a few people got saved, but there was never a church there, never, never heard from again. And he went across the, uh, the straits over to Corinth right after that. And he, he, he was with the people of Corinth, and, and he said the following things. He said, and I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom. He learned his lesson declaring to you the testimonies of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know, that, that testimony from this incredible man, he earned the right to be an ambassador and an apostle. The word apostle was not a religious term. Many of you have heard this. It was not a religious term. It was a term for a Roman general that would be sent into an occupied territory where they'd, they'd won a battle and they now possessed and ruled over that particular area. And the apostle would come in to really establish a culture commensurate with Rome to settle disputes and to bring people into the culture of Rome. And the hidden agenda of that was, and the goal of that work was to do something along these lines, to, to create a place where the emperor of Rome could come and feel at home. That's what an apostle was. Paul the apostle came to create, to endorse, to construct as much as possible a place where the king could feel at home. Kingdom principles, the power of God, the culture of the believing, that is what this is all about. And this morning, I, I, I believe that even, you know, especially first hour, I was out doing intro, but first hour, it was so palpable in here. I, I just knew Jesus was pleased. I, I, I just knew it. You could sense it. And when he is pleased to settle down here, we should get comfortable with what's happening. I remember Tommy Tenney telling a story about a man he had on staff with him. This man was gigantic. He, he weighed something like 400 pounds. And he was just a, he was a people person. And he hated Christmas every year because people would all invite him to the Christmas parties. And, and he would go, but he knew he couldn't go in the building and he couldn't sit down anywhere because he'd break any chair he sat in. Can you imagine? A people person. He would drive to the house and he'd get out and he'd make an excuse. He'd, he'd just come to the door, wave at everybody and stand in the, in the foyer and say hi. And, and then he'd have to go because he said, I, I knew if I went in there, there wasn't anything that could hold me. And Tommy made a story out of that, which I thought was so beautiful. He said, the Holy Spirit's like that. He knows that if he comes in certain places and settles in, he's going to break some things. We need a place in our hearts that's not so brittle that we can't bear the glory. And the Hebrew glory means is kabod, which means a weight. There is a weight to what the Spirit of God is up to. And God wants us to have a, a heart that can handle, that can welcome that can make the king feel at home. He wants us to be a people that are not afraid of his voice, a people not afraid of his presence, a people that are comfortable in these surroundings because he wants to settle down among us and let kingdom come. Yeah. He wants to do that. And why don't you stand? It's time for us to go. But... My, my passion is this. I've told you how precious the voice of God is to me and how I've told you a little bit of the stories that I have, just a little bit. But I'm telling you, it is life-changing. You do not want to get to heaven someday and have the Lord remind you of all the times that he spoke to you and you didn't recognize it. All that, I, my biggest nightmare, to be honest, as I wonder how many things I've missed. 
Boy, I see what happens when, when they, they, they open like a flower and this little seed becomes this thing. And I, I wonder, God, how many of those have I missed? This morning, I'm going to invite you to make a decision. I'm going to invite you to invite him. I'm going to invite you to say to God, God, I, I want to this morning bring my plans and my agenda and my beliefs and my fears and all the stuff that makes up who I am and how I, how I roll. I just want to put it on the altar today. If you can burn it up, burn it up. If you can grow it up, grow it up. But God, it's up to you if this thing lives or if this thing dies. You'll never be sorry. Even if you have to have a funeral for your big dream, you will never, ever be sorry. So if you'd like to make that, make that declaration today, I want you just to raise your hand. You've got to respond some way. You got to respond to him some way. Jesus. Jesus. We praise you today. You're a mighty God. You're a mighty God. And we ask you today, Lord, that you'd receive this sacrifice of her own heart, sacrifice of her own ways, the funeral for our own will. We lay it on the altar today, God, and we pray that you'd consume that which was not authored by you. Burn it up, God, in your presence. But what you can't burn, you shall purify by the same fire. And God, we ask today that you'd literally go before us and make our paths straight. We cast our cares on you, for you care for us. We literally, Lord God, commit our way to you that you may establish our path. And you do all things well. We're casting off from the shore today. The shore of people's expectations. The shore of others' will for us. They did not die for us. You did. You've proved your worth and your ways are past finding out but yet you share them with us. So God, we today make a clean breast of it. We're not holding anything in reserve. We're just saying, Lord God, here we are. Inhabit us, change us, transform our minds, we pray, to agree with yours. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Can you give him a shout? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night. The great is going on. You don't want to miss it.